Right guys, this question is going to be all about rates of reaction, okay? This question is from Paper 2 2022. As soon as it's formally available, I'll link it in the description down below along with the mark scheme. But until then, I can't show the actual paper on the screen due to AQA's copyright. So if you appreciate videos like these, these question breakdowns, be sure to like the video. It really helps the channel out. But let's jump into this question here. Question 1.1, an acidified solution of butanone reacts with iodine as shown below. Draw the displayed formula for this right here and give the name as well. All right, so organics, not too difficult here. Displayed, what does this mean? This simply means to display all the bonds. Real simple year one concept here. So let's do this. I'm gonna draw out my C's first to make things real easy for us. One, two, three, four. Then I'm gonna draw out the H's. So we're displaying every single bond here. This CO right here is a carbonyl ketone. So I'm going to show that. And there's two H's here. And then there's a good old iodine on the end, right? Iodide iron right here. All right. That's our displayed formula. Not too bad. Now we have to name it. Now I'm going to give you a juicy tip. When we're dealing with something that has a halogeno or a halo alkane, so a CI, CBR, CCL, something like that, this is always the lowest priority. It doesn't matter what else is in the molecule. This is always going to be the lowest priority. So when we're dealing with IUPAC nomenclature, right? When something is the lowest priority, where does it go in the name? It's always going to be the prefix, right? The start of the name. Then the other functional group present is going to be the suffix. Okay, that's just how naming works. Hopefully that is okay with you guys. So... The next thing we have to do is you always have to say what position carbon the halogen is on as well as the other functional group, right? Hopefully you're familiar with that. So if we want to make the functional groups the lowest carbon possible in the chain, we would use this side of the molecule to begin with, right? Because there's a ketone here, we want this to be the lowest. So for example, Let's say we started at this side, okay? Let's say we said this is carbon one, this is carbon two, this is carbon three, and this is carbon four. This carbonyl ketone is gonna be at carbon three in the chain. We do not want that. We want it to be the lowest number possible. So we're gonna switch this round and label it from right to left. So this is gonna be carbon one, this is carbon two, this is carbon three, and this is carbon four, okay? So if it's a halogen, you're gonna name it as the first part of the halogen. So for example, chloride or bromide or iodide. And then you're gonna end it with O, literally that easy. So chloro, bromo, ido, okay? So in this case, it's ido, so I'm just gonna rub this out. And then you have to say what position carbon it is, but you have to do that to begin with. So in this case, it's one iodo, and then you just name the rest of the molecule, right? So next up is our length of carbon chains. You always want to put that into these molecules to specify how many carbons are present in the carbon chain. How many are here? There's four. What is the name for four carbons? Bute, right? So it's going to be one iodo butan because it's a ketone. We have to specify which carbon the ketone functional group is on. This is in the second. So it's going to be one iodo butan two own. Okay, if you struggle with nomenclature, just practice some questions, learn the priority order so you know what's going to be the suffix, what's going to be the prefix, etc. And you should be completely fine. So that'll be our first two marks here. Going to get a mark for the display formula and going to get a mark for the name of the molecule. Now, one thing to keep in mind is in the mark scheme, this is in brackets, specifying that you don't need to actually write the position of the ketone functional group. I would personally say stick it in every single time just in case AQA isn't feeling very friendly. But if you did just put one iodobutanone, you'd be completely fine in this case, right? So let's move on to question 1.2. The rate equation for the above reaction is rate equals K, concentration of butanone and concentration of a proton. So we're moving on to a rate equation question. Interesting stuff here. The below table shows the initial concentrations used. The initial rate of reaction in the experiment is 1.45 times 10 to the minus 4. K 
Calculate the value of the rate constant k and give its units. Okay, so we're given a nice data table here that we can use to solve this question. Real easy three marks here, guys. If you have some decent maths ability, you should be able to rearrange this to make k the subject. They've already given you the rate equation. Just make k the subject, use our values from this table, and solve for k. Pretty simple stuff. Now, when it comes on to the units, I'll explain exactly how to do that. It's not too difficult either. So if we make k the subject, all you have to do is divide both sides by this, this uh, concentration values here. So we're going to just chuck it to the other side and divide it right here. So let's rewrite that out in our answer box and see what's going on. So it's going to be k equals rate, as I said, all divided by these concentrations. So we're going to have concentration of the butanone. and then concentration of our H plus. All right, so I'm gonna move that to make a bit more space here. And all we have to do now, guys, is plug in the values. So our rate of the experiment is given to us in the question, 1.45 times 10 to the minus four. Let's write out the units now, because then I can help you solve them afterwards. So it's gonna be mole per decimeter cubed per second. And then you want to do concentration of butanone, concentration of H+, plus, which is given to us in the question. What are our units here? It's given to us in the table, moles per decimeter cubed. So it's going to be 4.35. I'm actually going to write it out again. You don't need to write out the units for your answer, but it's just to help me teach it to you how to work out the final units. And then H+, plus is 0 0.825. Again, moles per decimeter cubed, our standard unit of concentration moles per decimeter cubed. So if you chuck that in your calculator, what is our answer for K going to be? It's going to be 4.040404 times 10 to the minus five. Okay. Now that is our answer spat out from the calculator, but we always in AQA and other examples really want to give our appropriate numbers, significant figures, even if they don't ask you to, right? So what we want to do here is look at the data given in the question and see how many significant figures are present. And we're going to use that to spit out what our final answer should be to the appropriate number of sig figs. So this right here, how many sig figs is this? This is three. How many is this? This is also three. And how many is this? This is also three. So it's safe to say then that our final answer can be 4.04 times 10 to the minus five, and that would be three significant figures. Okay, so we've got the answer, not too bad. Let's look at our units here, because that is also what we have to do to get all the marks, right? Give the units. So real simple stuff, all you have to do is cancel the top and the bottom of the fraction. So if there's something on the top, you can cancel it on the bottom. Hopefully that makes sense. So you can see here, there's a moles per decimeter cubed and a moles per decimeter cubed on the bottom. So I'm just gonna simply cancel those out. There's a per second on the top, but that doesn't match on the bottom. And there's a moles per decimeter cubed on the bottom, but that is no longer present on the top because we've canceled these two out. So when you have something present on the bottom of the fraction, you can think of it as one over that. So all you have to do in this instance, when you have one over something, very similar to this per second, is just going to be one over seconds, right? You just reverse the sign of the power. So for example, this is moles to the power of one. It's just invisible. And then you would have that as moles to the minus one. And then you would reverse this sign on this minus three to just be three. Okay, so let's write that out so you guys can understand what I mean here. So the final unit is gonna be mole. Remember I said it's a, an invisible one here. So it's gonna be to the minus one. Per decimeter cubed is now just decimeters cubed. And then this per second is gonna remain the same because we're not dividing it by anything. It's just staying right as it is. Okay, so hopefully that's fine for you guys. That would be our final units. Where would our marks come from, right? This would be our first mark. So rearranging the rate equation to make K the subject. Second mark would be from our final answer to three significant figures, 4.04 times 10 to the minus five. And then our third mark would be for the correct units per mole decimeter cube per second. Right, question 1.3, calculate the initial rate of reaction when the initial concentrations are halved. So real easy question, right? 
when it comes on to the rate equation, the power of the concentrations is telling you the order of reactant, okay? And the order of reactant tells you whatever the concentration or initial concentration is changed by, it's going to affect the rate equation in some way. Okay, I probably butchered that explanation, but if you guys have revised rate equations, that should make complete sense to you what I'm saying. So the first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna think to myself, what is our orders of reactants? And that will determine if the concentrations are halved, how our rate equation is going to change, right? So what is our order of reactant for this butanone and this hydrogen ion? It's simply one, okay? And then the order of iodine is simply zero. How do we know it's zero? It's because it's not present in the rate equation. Okay, if something is completely ignored from the rate equation as a reactant, we know that it has an order of zero, okay? So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna plug in my concentrations halved this time into this rate equation, okay? So it's gonna equal K. K from our previous question is gonna be exactly the same. The K value that we just calculated was 4.04, .04, okay? And that was times 10 to the minus five. So bracket that up, multiplied by our halved concentration of butanone. So 4.35 divided by two is gonna be 2.175, multiplied by our halved concentration of H plus ions. So this divided by two is just gonna be 0 0.4125, all right? Do we need to include iodine? No, we don't because it has an order of zero. So it's just completely absent from the rate equation. So plug that in your calculator and you're going to get an answer of 3.624638 times 10 to the minus five, right? Now, do we want this as our final answer? No, we do not. Again, we want to do it to the appropriate number of significant figures, which hasn't changed from our previous calculation. It's still three. So this to three sig figs is gonna be 3.62 times 10 to the minus five. So one easy mark right there. Just take some knowledge of orders of reactants and you'll be completely fine. All right, question 1.4, a bit of a weird one marker, but we're gonna roll with it. An experiment was carried out to quantify the time T elapsed for the complete reaction of an iodine solution, right? That's really important right here. Upon addition to an excess of an acidifying solution of butanone. All right, suggest an observation used to judge when all of the iodine had completely reacted. So suggest is our command word here. We're gonna have an observation. Do you know what observation that's gonna be when all of the iodine has completely reacted? It's gonna be brown to colorless, okay? Why is that? It's because iodine solution, I2 solution is brown or orange, orangey brown, okay? So when that is completely used up, you're gonna get an absence of color, okay? So you can say brown color removed, or you can say brown to colorless, or you can say goes colorless if you don't know the color of iodine. I would try and avoid that, and I'd be very specific with my observation right here. So I would say brown to colorless. So as I said, real easy one mark, just involves some knowledge of halide, halidine, <laughs> halogen color changes. Right, I'm getting a bit more interesting here. I've drawn out a very rough version of the chart, but it can give you all the information you need to know to answer this question, so it's all good. The experiment was repeated at different temperatures. The below graph shows how one over T varied with different temperatures describe and explain the shape of the graph and we're given three marks for this question right so our command words we've got two here we've got describe as well as explain so that is the exact order that i'm going to answer the question in i'm going to describe what's going on and then i'm going to explain why that is so pause the video and think to yourself can i describe the shape of this graph and can i explain why this is the case Right, so as I mentioned, I'm gonna describe it. So simply, what is our axis here? We have an x-axis of temperature, and then we have a y-axis of one over T. So I'm just gonna say as the temperature increases, what happens to the rate, the one over T? 
the rate of reaction, one over T, increases. Now, how does it increase? Is it linear or is it exponential? Okay, that's the two key words we want to think of, and it increases exponentially. Okay, so I'm going to put that in blue. And if you're not too familiar with exponential and linear and logarithmic and stuff like that, you can simply say instead of exponentially, by a greater factor or by an increasing factor. Okay, those are both accepted. I would just stick with the keyword exponential. Okay, makes things real easy for us. So we've done our first part. We've described what's going on. Now we have to explain why that is the case. And there's some real key terminology that AQA really needs you to write here. So pay attention if you can and remember this. So I'm going to start with because to sort of initiate our response with the explain command words. And it's simply because a significantly greater proportion of particles have energy greater than the activation energy. And what does that mean? It means that the frequency of successful collisions is going to increase. OK, the more particles that have energy greater than activation energy, the more collisions are going to occur because they're flying and buzzing around. And there's going to be more successful collisions because the energy is greater than activation energy. The reaction is actually going to occur. OK, so let's write what you would put here. In my words, you may have something slightly different. So this is along the lines of what I would have actually written in my exam. I would have just brain dumped everything on the page to try and explain why this is occurring. Now, you don't need to write the exact same thing as me. All you need to say is this portion here. And the mark scheme, all it said is many more particles have energy greater than the activation energy. OK, th that is not what I would have written, but that's what the mark scheme says. I would have written it more like significantly greater proportion, more sort of fancy words. But that's what I would have put on the page. All we need to say is many more particles. OK, and the other two marks actually just comes from the description. So it's as temperature increases, first mark, the rate of reaction increases exponentially, second mark. And then the third mark comes from here. I also added the frequency of successful collisions increases part just because that's what I would have memorized from doing other past papers. So I would have also chucked that in as well just to cover my backside. But you don't need it to get the marks. All right. OK, final question here is going to be 1.6. So it's asking us what is the time taken for the reaction at 35 degrees Celsius in seconds. All right, so pretty easy question here as long as you understand units. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my chart over here and I'm going to say, OK, where on the X axis is my temp 35 degrees? I'm going to draw a line up to where my plot is, where my cross is on the chart. And then I'm going to trail that along to read off where my per second value is. So I've drawn this not completely accurate, but in the actual paper, your value for one over T when it's at 35 degrees C is going to be 0 0.03. All right. So then one over T when the temperature is 35 degrees C, it's going to equal 0 0.03. But that is per second. Have they asked for per second? No, they have not. They've asked for second. So what is per second? Per second is simply one over S, one over seconds, right? So what you want to do here is the reciprocal to get it into seconds. OK, so you can think of this 0 0.03 as 0 0.03 over one. So if you do the reciprocal of that, it's going to be one over 0 0.03 and that will get it back into seconds, right? So if you put that in your calculator, you're going to get an answer of 33.33 recurring. Is that our final answer? No. How many significant figures do we need to give? Our data was given to two significant figures. So we're going to give it to two. And that would be our final answer. 33 seconds. One mark right there. Just take some understanding of rearranging units and reciprocals of fractions. But hopefully you'll be completely fine if something like this pops up in your past papers or your exam. So hopefully you found that helpful, guys. If you did like the video, it really helps the channel out. Let me know if you have any questions down below. Hopefully you were able to follow along and got similar answers. Best of luck in your revision and upcoming exams, guys. Until next time, peace.